Hello and welcome to Talk Vietnam. It's our honor to have with us here in our studio, Michael Williams, Chief of Communications and Public Affairs at the Geneva Bay's World Meteorological Organization and Bernadette Woods Plackey, Climate Central Chief Meteorologist and Director of Climate Matters. Hi, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're glad to have you here today. So climate change to start off with, it is a concept that we've all heard of. Um, so what is this actual definition? Can you share with us? Well, climate change usually refers to man-made long-term changes in the climate. So something that will occur over decades and centuries as a result of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. So we usually refer to also climate variability to talk about natural changes in the climate. So the important distinction about climate change is that it's man-made, something we're causing, and something that we have to do something about. Okay, so you mentioned that it's something that we have to do something about. So how severe is the situation of climate change around the world at the moment? Uh, climate change is happening gradually. Uh, the worst effects will be felt decades from now, 100 years from now and beyond. Uh, but already we're seeing the effects of climate change. We're seeing changes in weather patterns. We're seeing changes in the seasons. Uh, we're seeing higher sea levels, uh, changes in temperatures, uh, drought and flood around the world. So already many parts of the world are starting to experience uh, the first effects. Okay, so um, we've, uh, according to research, uh, 2015 is anticipated to be the warmest year ever on record. Uh, what are the implications of this globally? This is a big one. This really is. I mean, of course, records. You're going to get records, cold, hot, in any given weather pattern, in any given climate pattern. But when you add in human cause, climate change, we are seeing the tip toward extreme heat more and more. So not only is this likely to be the hottest year on record, we're already running hottest. We already have had the hottest summer on record, the hottest spring on record, and the hottest month ever recorded going back to 1880. But with a really strong El Nino in place, that's why scientists are so certain that this will be the hottest year on record. And to add to that, that's coming off a record hot year last year. And the 10 hottest years have all happened since 1998. It's also important to note that the oceans are also experiencing record heat. And so they're keeping a lot of heat that will eventually come back out, partly through the El Nino, but in general over many decades to come. Mm -hmm. So we're building up uh, a lot of future records uh, to come in the, in the years ahead. Wow, so you mentioned how the ocean is actually holding a lot of heat. Um, According to the uh, journal Science, with um, every two degrees Celsius of global warming, um, there will be at least six meters of um, sea level rises in certain areas around the world. Um, what do you think about this? Well, that's not good. <laughs> and that'll certainly happen over centuries, so there'll be time to, to adapt and so forth. But it does imply the loss of an incredible rich cultural heritage of many of our major cities, which are, of course, built on coastlines. Um, so even the two degrees centigrade, which is the internationally agreed goal not to go above it, but recognizing we're going to come close to it, uh, tells us that that's, not, um, that's also going to be a big problem. And another thing with the two degrees centigrade, there is an implication that could put some of our parts of our climate on a tipping point. There are certain ice sheets that will go past the point of being able to refreeze again if we do take any action on our climate that will not only play into our oceans and sea level rise, but our whole climate system is connected. So it kicks off a series of other events too. Parts of the globe are going to have more heavy precipitation. The heat events are only going to get stronger and more prolonged. Our oceans not only are getting hotter, but with all the uptake of carbon dioxide, they're getting more acidic. And that is really tipping the whole ecosystem out of balance. Mm. So how about our country, Vietnam in particular? Um, how do you think climate change is affecting Vietnam and can you sort of like, show us some evidence of this? Well, there's a few different things. Yeah. It does fall in the globe of some of the major things. Heat events are going to get stronger and more prolonged. One of the big problems around here too is the sea level rise implications. Not only does that really eat away at the infrastructure along the coastlines, but when we talk about typhoons making landfall, they bring a stronger, higher storm surge that's going to go farther inland. Nằm ở vùng hạ lưu của ngã ba sông, trong vùng đồng bằng ven biển miền trung của Việt Nam, đô thị cổ Hội An, di sản văn hóa thế giới đang phải đối mặt với những mối đe dọa của thiên tai. Những ngôi nhà bằng gỗ hàng trăm năm tuổi nhiều lần bị nhấn chìm trong nước, lũ lụt diễn ra với tần suất ngày một dày hơn. 
biển đang tiến sâu vào đất liền với một tốc độ mà con người không thể ngờ được. 35 năm sau trận lụt lịch sử năm 1964, cả Hội An lại chìm sâu trong nước lũ. Mực nước trên sông Thu Bồn khi đó đạt 3m21, nước đã ngập đến lưng tầng 1 của cả một khu phố. Đó cũng là năm mà UNESCO vừa công nhận Hội An là di sản văn hóa thế giới năm 1999. Tần suất của những trận lũ lớn ngày một dày hơn, 8 năm sau vào năm 2007, kỷ lục đã bị phá vỡ. Mực nước trên sông Thu Bồn đạt 3m28 và 8.000 ngôi nhà của phố cổ đã bị nhấn chìm trong nước lũ. Khoảng 6 năm sau, 2013, lũ đổ về dồn dập trong một khoảng thời gian ngắn đã khiến cho phố cổ ngập sâu tới 3 mét và hàng ngàn du khách đã phải đi sơ tán. Với kịch bản phát thải thấp, nhiệt độ sẽ tăng lên một độ vào giữa thế kỷ, sau đó mới dừng lại. Còn với kịch bản phát thải cao, nhiệt độ cuối thế kỷ có thể tăng thêm 3,4 đến 5,3 độ. Nằm sát biển, mối đe dọa lớn nhất với Hội An là nước biển dân. Nền đất ở đây vốn đã thấp, chỉ hơn mực nước biển 1m25. Đến năm 2100, biến đổi khí hậu làm nước biển dâng lên 1m, thì khoảng cách này chỉ còn là hơn một gang tay. Trong kịch bản xấu nhất, có thể Hội An sẽ phải hứng chịu nhiều yếu tố cùng lúc, như nước biển dâng, chiều cường cao, siêu bão, nước dâng do bão cộng với nước mưa lớn do bão chút xuống, lũ thượng nguồn về, toàn bộ khu phố cổ sẽ đều bị nhấn chìm, mức ngập khoảng 3,5 mét, nơi sâu nhất là 5 mét. Các ngôi nhà cổ một tầng ven sông Hoài, nơi trũng thấp nhất phố cổ Hội An sẽ có thể bị chìm hẳn. Ngay cả những nhà cao hơn cũng sẽ ngập đến quá nửa tầng 2. Lũ không chỉ gây ngập sâu hơn mà thời gian còn có thể kéo dài hơn từ 1 đến 2 tuần. Điều này sẽ làm hư hại các di sản cổ vốn đã bị bào mòn bởi thời gian. Lũ lớn cũng sẽ cuốn theo nhiều bùn đất và khi nước rút đi, bùn động lại trên các mái nhà khiến mái có thể bị sập. Ước tính sẽ có khoảng 70 ngôi nhà cổ, tức khoảng 10% số nhà cổ của Hội An có thể sụp đổ hoàn toàn. Developing countries like Vietnam, countries in Southeast Asia, uh, sea levels are rising two to three times higher than in other countries. Uh, how do you think this is affecting developing countries uh, like Vietnam? Well, people talk about Haiyan, for example, which, which struck the Philippines not long ago. Philippines is one of these countries where the sea levels have risen uh, two or three times higher. And th therefore, the storm surges they experienced as a result of Haiyan were much, much greater uh, than they would have been otherwise. Also in New York, we had Hurricane Sandy uh, a few years ago, and that also uh, you know, flooded, um, flooded uh, Battery Park, the southern tip of Manhattan, a thing that had never really happened before. And uh, much of this is also attributed to rising sea levels. And there's now a strong consensus that um, climate change is actually affected by human activity. So uh, can you please sort of tell us more about the evidence of this and um, how that's perceived by the global media at the moment? Well, it's a really simple concept, actually, that sometimes it can play out in complicated ways, but we understand what the greenhouse effect is, and we understand what greenhouse gases do. Essentially, when you put these greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, methane, into the atmosphere, they are heat trapping, and they keep more heat in the atmosphere than allow it to escape. So even the littlest bit can tip that balance toward higher temperatures. And when you get those higher temperatures, they play out in many different ways in our climate system. So basically a lot of energy is being trapped into the atmosphere. And that's what's really accelerating the hydrological cycle. And that's why it brings you know, more rapid changes in flooding and in rain, more heavy rainfalls, this kind of thing. It's all that extra energy, which also expresses itself as heat. Can you sort of um, focus on the link between climate change and uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions? So there's many, you can find many graphs of this, but the, the carbon emissions continue growing up. Carbon remains in the atmosphere for centuries uh, once it's emitted. So even the carbon dioxide emissions from the 1700s, 1800s, most of it is still in the atmosphere. And you can see that the chart rising steadily. We're coming up to 400 parts per million. Uh, and uh, it used to be, what, 360, I think was the... Before the industrial era, it was mm. 280. 280. When they started taking records from the one particular site in mm. Mauna Loa, that was in the low 300s. And we just keep on climbing. And that's why the long life cycle of carbon, as he was saying, it stays up in that atmosphere for a long time. So even if we were able to stop all of our missions today, which we're not set up to do so, it's going to take some time. But even if we were, we're already locking more climate change into our system and more warming.
the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has actually calculated a budget for how, many, how much carbon dioxide the atmosphere can absorb and to keep us at 2 degrees centigrade. And their calculations were that we've actually already used up two-thirds of the amount of carbon dioxide we can emit and still save at a supposedly safe level. So we have a major challenge ahead to, to keep ourselves below this, this uh, carbon uh, budget. Michael and Beninet would in Hanoi this time for an international workshop which guides weather presenters how to communicate the science of climate change to the public in an effective way. Let's take a closer look. For the first time ever, the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, conducted a workshop for weather presenters and meteorologists in Southeast Asia at Vietnam Television in Hanoi between the 29th and the 30th of September. The event was a chance for 17 meteorologists and weather presenters from seven Asian countries and WMO to exchange knowledge on climate change and get an update on the situation in the region. The experts held that climate change in Southeast Asia is a big concern as it is happening in close relation to unusual weather events. Tiếp theo là có những trận mưa đá mà là không không thể ngờ được kích thước của những cái viên đá có thể đến 15cm rất lớn. Thì những cái hiện tượng đấy mà nó xảy ra không phải là liên tục năm này qua năm khác nhưng có những cái hiện tượng xảy ra mà hoàn toàn bất thường. It follows the global projection. That means without any intervention the temperature will continue to rise. July 2015 became the world's hottest month ever recorded in history. Asia, including Vietnam, has been forecast to suffer the most from global warming, with sea level rise and regular flooding seen as the most evident proof. As extreme events tend to recur more frequently, experts stress on the important role of media in raising people's awareness on climate change. People in the world is not really believe that climate change must happen. Media is a very strategic part of um, social life to inform, to inform the people about um, uh, awareness of the climate change and change the mindset of the people and uh, do something uh, useful for the reduce the climate change, reduce the emission, reduce the carbon. According to a report by the Ministry of Planning and Investment, climate change may cost Vietnam 11% of its GDP in 2030. A research by Dara International and Climate Vulnerable Forum CVF shows that climate change is partly responsible for some 4,000 human deaths per year and the loss of about 1.2% of global GDP, equaling 1.2 trillion US dollars. Has there been any survey, any indication that shows how aware people are um, on the impacts of climate change? There's a lot of academic research, especially, I guess, in the West. Uh, surveys conducted on a regular basis, trying to see what people think about it, how, how willing do they believe the science, how willing are they to invest in making action, do they think their governments could take action. So you see these surveys on a regular basis. And they do show that, that people are committed. I think people often don't know exactly what they should do uh, because it's such an enormous problem. And you know, turning off the lights or not driving your car is all very helpful. But a lot of the changes uh, and solutions have to be really at the, at the social level, at, at a large scale level of policy and so forth. So a lot of people still don't really know uh, how to respond, what, what they can do to contribute. In order to raise awareness of climate change, what do you think are the current greatest challenges that um, sort of the media uh, are facing at the moment? It's a complicated subject. It's a very complicated subject um, that has so many layers to it. And in some parts of the, the world, and the United States in particular, it's gotten tied to political angles too. So that becomes a challenge to have to work through when you really just want to get down to what is going on and why this is important and why we should care. And especially at the individual level. So it's great. People should understand the greenhouse effect and the broad picture of climate change. But we really want people to understand how it affects them and their family and, the, and their children looking ahead a few decades and what they can do at their level, you know, in their town, 
uh, with, with their power to do something about climate change. Weather presenters are now playing an important role in helping to raise public awareness on climate change. Let's find out how they do that in the following. One of the biggest challenges facing communications on climate change is the complexity of the issue, which highly relates to terminology. The winnings on Superstorm Haiyan in 2013, put forth by the Pagasa Astronomical Observatory in the Philippines, has been quoted at the workshop as a typical example. The warning uh, it contained the word storm surge. Unfortunately, the community did not understand what storm surge is. So it's a miscommunication. The community did not recognize that that word, which is storm surge, is damaging. That's why experts stressed on the role of weather presenters in attracting public attention to the issues of climate change and make complex terms understandable for audience. It's just like eating. The food is the information, and they have to cut this into bite size so that the people who are the user of the information can easily digest this information. They are great public communicators who are already on TV talking to people about the weather and extreme events that are going to evolve under climate change. And so we're trying to make uh, climate change feel more personal and immediately relevant to people and how it's going to affect them and their lives and their communities. In some regional TV stations, the weather presenters have proven themselves as the key to attracting audience to the news on weather and climate. Thai people are not interested in weather that much. We don't um, face with a disaster that much. So many channels have the way to attracting people, and TV5 choose us because it's the new, it's like a new one that no, no channel that have to insist on being weather presenters. Climate change causes the sea to rise. According to the WMO, sea rise level over the past 20 years has reached 3.2 millimeters per year, almost double the average of 1.7 millimeters per year recorded in the previous century. I'm aware that you used to be a weather forecaster yourself, so you do know the link between sort of um, weather communications and the combating against climate change. Can you sort of uh, tell us about the role, the importance of um, television at the moment uh, in combating climate change? Well, it's such a large problem, climate change, and there's so much that still needs to be done with it. And TV weather presenters and weather forecasters in general really have an opportunity because the public trusts them. They come to them on a regular basis for their weather information and since it's the same physics, it's the same science, you have this incredible opportunity as a weather presenter to really bring that science of what is going on because the public does have a lot of questions to them directly. And these are the reasons many people in the United Nations are very excited about this project and the whole idea of engaging weather presenters. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is aware of this project and has spoken to people about it. Uh, the Executive Secretary of the Climate Change Convention, uh, the, the leaders of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, even the French Foreign Minister uh, Laurent Fabius, who will be the uh, president of the conference in Paris in a few weeks, uh, is also very excited about the potential of weather presenters to bring climate change to people and explain to them how this will affect them where they live in, in their country and why it's important. The United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP21, will take place in Paris this December. The intended nationally determined contributions, or INDCs, are a key component of the negotiations to finalize the Paris Agreement. The INDCs can be defined as a commitment of the participating countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Vietnam has established a research group in charge of working on Vietnam's report for the conference. Trên cái cơ sở tất cả các cái nghiên cứu của Việt Nam từ trước đến giờ về vấn đề biến đổi khí hậu cũng như dự báo cho cái việc phát triển kinh tế xã hội từ nay đến 2030 thì cái nhóm công tác đã làm việc và tập hợp cái nội dung thành cái báo cáo của Việt Nam. 
Vietnam has organized some conferences in recent months to collect opinions for the INDC report. The deadline for the countries to present the report at COP21 in Paris is this December. Chúng ta đã có cái chiến lược biến đổi khí hậu, chiến lược tăng trưởng xanh có nghị quyết 24 của chính của của ban chấp hành trung ương về biến đổi khí hậu. Nhưng những cái văn bản đó, những cái con số, những cái mục tiêu đó nó mang tính chất định hướng. Khi mà đưa vào trong báo cáo dự kiến đóng góp của quốc gia tự quyết định thì những cái con số chúng ta đưa vào, những mục tiêu chúng ta đưa vào sẽ trở thành cái ràng buộc bắt mình phải thực hiện mà ràng buộc mang tính chất pháp lý. Many institutions, including non-governmental organizations, have participated in consulting for Vietnam to revise the report. Các tổ chức đã thực hiện các cái biện pháp hoặc là giúp cho những người dân ở trong các cộng đồng dễ bị tổn thương thực hiện các cái giải pháp mà giảm nhẹ rủi ro thiên tai, thích ứng với biến đổi khí hậu và giảm nhẹ biến đổi khí hậu với những cái giải pháp mà phù hợp với năng lực cũng như là cái chúng tôi cũng đưa ra những cái khuyến nghị cụ thể đối với việc là đàm phán của chính phủ Việt Nam ở tại COP 21. COP 21 will run from November the 30th to December the 11th in Paris. The conference is expected to be the last chance for all participating countries to achieve an agreement to limit global temperatures from rising no more than 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial era. COP21 uh, also addressed uh, the issue of climate change as well. Uh, what do you think have been the greatest achievements of COP21 this year? Well, the negotiations are ongoing. Um, there's some very exciting news recently, uh, especially with President Xi of China and President Obama of the United States. China has said that it wants to make sure that its emissions peak by the year 2030 and then start declining. That's a remarkable statement coming from China, which is such an important country. Uh, we need more countries to make similar statements and to make similar pledges when they come to Paris in December. Uh, the, the fact that we have some leadership happening is, is very exciting, Pope Francis, uh, all of these new players who are, are showing which side they're on is, is incredibly valuable. Personally, I, I'm optimistic that in Paris we'll get, we'll get a reasonable agreement that will show that uh, green, greenhouse gases need to be phased out and we'll give business and cities and governments a signal uh, to start putting prices on, on carbon and to start uh, moving towards a carbon-free world by the end of the century. And businesses are playing a big role in this too. In the past, and Michael knows a little bit more about this than I do, but it seems like a lot of the cops have been very focused on the governments. But at this point, we're hearing a lot of the big, large corporations around the world who are themselves committing to doing something, to bringing down their impact, to bringing down their greenhouse gas emissions. And that plays into it because it's everybody. We all need to do our part to come together. So a new global plan has been adopted this year at the UN summit on September the 25th to combat poverty reduction. How do you think climate change will threaten the success of uh, poverty reduction in this uh, sustainable development goal? As Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and others would emphasize that they're strongly linked. Uh, they're part of the two sides of the same coin. And so many of the actions to address climate change uh, will contribute to sustainable development in terms of advances in agriculture and energy and other sectors. And many of the impacts of climate change will undermine sustainable development by, by making uh, poor farmers even more vulnerable than they are today, by causing um, uh, environmental migrants, um, by, by causing you know, more damage to urban centers and this kind of thing. And water is a major, major issue going forward. And we already have water issues if you even take climate change out of the picture. But with climate change, there's going to be a lot of places that are already susceptible to drought that it's going to get that much worse for that much longer. And that will really affect those economies, that agriculture, that whole way of living. At the same time, the places that get wet tend to be getting wetter with more rounds of heavy rain coming in, in bigger amounts. So that also will play into those systems, those sewage systems, what they can really maintain, what that infrastructure is, those road systems. And so on both sides, it's going to have impacts. Climate change is a challenging issue facing all countries in the 21st century. 
The impacts of climate change are accelerating globally, and in Vietnam, it is no exception. In December 2008, the Vietnamese government approved the National Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. That means climate change issues have been officially included in national development policies as one of the top priorities of the Vietnamese government. Accordingly, Vietnam will focus on mitigating impacts on agriculture caused by sea level rise and natural disasters and minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. Vietnam was one of the first nations to join and ratify the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Kyoto Protocol. The country has also strived to create a better legal corridor for natural disaster mitigation and climate change adaptation. So can you share with us what you know about the efforts to curb carbon emissions and climate change uh, in developed countries at the moment? Well, uh, cities are taking, uh, I read a very nice article on the way in the airplane here um, about the, our old mayor in New York, Mr. Bloomberg, uh, talks about uh, all the things that cities can do. Because cities, I think, did he say 70% of emissions come from cities? Uh, they have a lot of regulatory control over public transport over buildings. He's even saying if you paint buildings white on top, uh, that they reflect light out and it reduces the, the heat in, in the city. Uh, you know, waste management, they have control over all these things. Um, I was in Beijing lately and uh, they of course have terrible air pollution coming from the automobiles, so a lot of, a lot of incentive to, to reduce uh, traffic pollution and greenhouse gas emissions with that. They've been building, um, I think there, I forget how many, they have a large number of underground uh, metro trains, uh, subway trains, uh, to get people out of cars and down into these clean uh, public transport systems. Uh, so there's a lot of things like that that, that can be done. Uh, there's no magic bullet, one thing, one solution that fixes it. It has to be a lot of little steps, making buildings more energy efficient, uh, transport uh, more efficient, more public transport, um, it, it, you know, incentives for industry, uh, all across the board. So how about less developed countries? How have they been participating in combating climate change? So in the climate change negotiations, of course, uh, there's, there's the point that most of the existing budget that we've used up, that I mentioned before, the two-thirds of the budget, uh, was the, the developed countries of the West who used that. Uh, so now developing countries are starting to industrialize and they're finding that their share of the atmosphere was already used up in effect. So this is a you know big discussion in, in, in the negotiations. That's not that's not fair. That's not just. Uh, but there is a lot of incentives for developing countries, uh, with some support, to move into these cleaner technologies. I think we all imagine the year 2100 uh, will not be powered by coal. When you imagine science fiction or spaceships or anything, spaceships are not powered by coal. And so we're move. You, you have to imagine our future is towards clean energy. But what we need to do is accelerate that trend because climate change is happening faster maybe than our technological developments. So we're just pushing against an open door and trying to get ourselves faster into a world where technologies are more efficient by reducing, as I said before, traffic. Uh, you also help the health of people uh, in, in cities like Hanoi. Um, there's a lot of, lot of co-benefits, as they're called, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions because you reduce other, other problems that are causing immediate uh, issues for people. And the other thing to think about, too, are opportunities. As, as Michael was just saying, this is where developing countries still have the opportunity to be big players in the implementation of wind and solar energy and really lead the way as we do move forward. Another analogy is in Africa where they moved away, you know, rather than going through all the fixed telephone wires everywhere, they, they skipped, they leapfrogged, we call it, to cell, cellular phones. Right, so they skip that old technology. So there's a lot of opportunities for developing countries also to skip some of the dirty, polluting technologies and move on to new ones, uh, which is very much their economic and, and you know, immediate health benefits as well as contributing to the global solution. If global carbon emissions and sea levels are affected by climate change, about 2.6% of the global population, or about 177 million people, will be living in a place at risk of regular flooding. Globally, sea levels have risen 0.19 meters since 1900. But long-term circulation patterns and geology are causing sea level to rise faster in some parts of the world 
like Southeast Asia, where sea level is rising at two to three times faster than the global average. More than a quarter of Vietnam's residents live in areas likely to be subject to regular floods by the end of the century. Across the globe, about one person in 40 lives in a place likely to be exposed to such flooding by the end of the century, absent significant changes. So now let's go to Vietnam just to see how the picture of climate change in the country. Um, what are the projections, what are the most prominent projections uh, in terms of climate change in Vietnam? I think as far as Vietnam goes, two of the biggest things that stand out are the increase in heat. It will be more intense for longer periods of time. And heat is a big impact on every human being. We saw huge heat waves across the world this past year. And unfortunately, the death toll do go hand in hand with that. The other thing, sea level rise. We've talked a lot about sea level rise already today. This is a huge coastal country, and not only with regular localized flooding becoming more prominent, but when we do have a landfalling typhoon, or one that's coming even close to land, it will have higher storm surge that pushes farther inland, flooding more people and providing more damage with it. So what can Vietnam do to guarantee success on all these campaigns and all these projects? I know that your president was, because I read the newspaper on, on the plane, uh, was in New York speaking with Ban Ki-moon, and I, I read a quote where he pledged that Vietnam would be part of the solution and would uh, contribute to Paris and so forth. So at the highest political level here in Vietnam, uh, you have a lot of support. I think that there's a lot of awareness and interest here, in part because Vietnam is quite vulnerable, as we've been talking about, you know, impacts on, uh, you know, if, if it gets hotter, Vietnam is already a hot country and rice must have its, its uh, temperature limits. Uh, I don't know what they are, but most plants have some kind of limit beyond which uh, yields go down. Uh, there may be concerns about that, and certainly sea level rise and, and storms and so forth. Uh, so I think that uh, people here are aware that they have a great stake in the, in the climate change issue. What sort of areas around the world are the strongest hit by climate change? And can you share with us some stories and some stats about that? Well, certainly the Arctic and uh, the far north, Alaska in the United States, of course, is uh, being hit terribly by the warmth, which is changing the whole ecosystem of the region. Uh, sea ice is melting at record rates. They're discovering a cold, a cold spot in the North Atlantic now, in contrast to the rest of the oceans, which are hot, which probably comes from the melting ice, and um, it's not a good thing. For It could affect European weather uh, in different ways. Uh, so certainly the northern, uh, the further away you are from the, the poles, the, the stronger the impacts are so far. And another thing, there have been some huge, deadly heat waves this past year. In addition to it being likely the hottest year on mm -hmm. record, there throughout Europe well, where you were living. In Geneva, in Switzerland where I live, we had the record uh, day in July of 39.7 degrees centigrade. So it's the, the all-time record for Geneva just this summer. India had a terrible heat wave that caused a lot of deaths. The United States has been go having ongoing heat for this past basically two years over our West Coast, and it's likely to be the hottest year on record for a lot of those states across the West. We're seeing this in many mm -hmm. different locations. Global warming is a gradual rise of average temperature on Earth, first recorded in the middle of the 20th century. The temperature of the Earth's surface rose by some one degree Celsius in the previous century. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has come to a conclusion that greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are the main cause of the observed global warming. Carbon dioxide typically represents these greenhouse gases. Globally, the carbon dioxide concentration has increased from 280 parts per million of ppm in the pre-industrial era to some 387 ppm in the year 2009. Some media outlets have actually stated that um, climate change is a natural part of the Earth's cycle. What's your response to this? Does it mean that we just sit there and do nothing and let it happen? 
Well, it is a natural part of our cycle. Climate has changed in the past and it will continue to change in the future, but we are adding to those changes at a very quick rate, quicker than we've known in the history of our temperature records, going way back in time. So, no, we shouldn't just sit around and do nothing about it because we've established a world in the way that we know it. And if we continue to add greenhouse gases, we're not going to be able to maintain that. An interesting fact is that the average temperature of the planet today is between 14 and 15 degrees centigrade. During the ice ages, when much of the northern hemisphere was covered by ice, it was four degrees colder. Those four degrees, the, the planet was fine. Uh, fortunately, we were not here in the same way we are today. Uh, but that, that four degrees made that incredible uh, change that would have affected modern human society in a way that's impossible to imagine. So then imagine four degrees centigrade going the other way, you know, an ex extra heat. Uh, the planet will do fine. Uh, many species will live. The Earth will continue. It's the human race with all of its modern infrastructure, the seven, eight billion people that will suffer. Why do you guys think that a, um, an agreement, a global agreement, an unified agreement uh, by global leaders um, on climate change has yet to be reached? What are the challenges to this? Well, there's the so-called free rider problem. So my missions affect everybody. Um, but if I don't Bother, if I you know, decide to enjoy my big car and not to hurt, reduce my emissions, but you reduce your emissions, I benefit from that. So there's an incentive to let everybody else solve the problem uh, rather than, than take on the, 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 the expense and trouble of doing it oneself. Um, there's also the issue for many developing countries, they don't really have the funding and the resources and the technologies to move towards greener technologies. And so that's been a big issue in the discussions about how to help countries have access to resources and technologies to make the transition into these cleaner technologies that we're going to need. Uh, there's also vested interests. I mean, for example, you have uh, petrol stations and cars as an enormous infrastructure. To replace that, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not obvious. So it's a massive problem. Um, anyone can be a free rider and help everyone, let everyone else deal with the problem. Uh, it's a very, in the 195 countries or whatever it is, uh, trying to negotiate and agree on how to share the burden and who leads. It's, it's, it's a major, major challenge, clearly. And two more points to add to what Michael was saying there. There's no real face of climate change. It's, it, you don't see these gases in the atmosphere. You can't, well, some, you see what their effects are and their impacts are sometimes, but it doesn't always just have this one big, huge landfall like a hurricane does or a typhoon does. So sometimes it's hard for people to relate to locally what climate change means to them. And then the other thing too is it's long term. Like we were saying earlier, even if we stop today, we're still committing so much more climate change to our atmosphere. So it's really hard to sometimes grasp that concept that we need to make decisions today for things that are going to happen decades still in the future. Thank you very much for your interesting insights. We are really honored to have you on our show, and we wish you the best of luck with your future endeavors. Thank well, you thank you much. for having us. Enjoyed it. Cheers. And that's it for this edition of Talk Vietnam. I hope that this program has been greatly helpful in helping your understanding of the impact of climate change, as well as the efforts that have been made to combat this issue. That's it for now, and until next time on Talk Vietnam.